Amen. Amen. Thank you, praise team and choir, and thank you, Miss Jan. Thank you, sound tech media team. We're dismissing our children to, to Children's Church. I don't know what that was, but that wasn't me. Um, we're dismissing you guys to Children's Church. You guys have a great time uh, studying and, and learning about Jesus and y'all's context. We're excited about what you guys get to experience. They, they get taught the word, and it's so foundational. One of the things that I am very passionate about is, as your pastor is making sure that everything we do is gospel-centric. Uh, we, we could make a lot of noise, and we could do a lot of things. In fact, we could, we could have hype. People have told me, Jeff, if you wouldn't preach so hard, people would come back more. And listen, I, I, and I know that. If I preach that fluff and I preach you're the best you now, um, I would probably gain more members. But at our church, we, we want to be gospel focused and we want to be about Jesus um, because I could tell you how great you are but the Bible doesn't say that the Bible doesn't say that in fact when I read the word of God it tells me that my best is as filthy rags before Jehovah God my best is nothing but towards Yahweh Rapha my best is nothing when it comes to the Elohim of the Old and New Testament my best will not gain me entrance into glory my best is nothing my best is insufficient my best will let you down my best can't comprehend the fullness and the glory of God but when we look at him as good when we look at him as great when we look at the great and mighty Jesus the name at which every knee will bow and the name that every tongue is going to confess to when we look at him and we build our foundation on the rock that is Jesus Christ we can have something then I want you to love Jesus more than I want you to love anything else I want you to love Jesus more than you love anything else there's a great tension in the church that if we would just be fun, that we, you know, woo, yeah, more people would come. I would rather you fall in love with Jesus and hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then you know what happens? It becomes fun. I have a blast worshiping our creator together. In fact, it's one of the highlights of my week. I, I wake up on Sunday different than I wake up any day of the week. I wake up ready because you're coming and I'm going to be here and we're going to do something incredible in the presence of God. Something very special happens when the church gathers together. This isn't just an hour out of your week. This is empowering as we gather. The Bible tells us that we grow when we're together. And so I'm glad you're here. Turn your Bible to the book of John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is a unique chapter because Jesus begins to do things in the text that he had, he had not done before, and yet he's going he's gonna to kind of catch some, some flack for it. He's going to catch some resistance for it because he, he wasn't afraid of being culturally different. If ever there was a day that the church could model difference, it would be today. Have you ever gotten a job that you weren't qualified for? couple of us, yeah. There's a couple of us that, hey, you've gotten jobs you shouldn't, you shouldn't have got. When I was in college, I had, some of you have, have caught on, and you've had, Jeff, how many jobs did you have when you were in college? It was a lot. It was a lot. I was hustling. I was, if it was a dollar to be made, I was making it. I, I just, I, I was, I, I didn't like being broke, and so I, I would work 40, 50 hours a week and still be full-time in, in class. I just, I've never minded a hard day's work. So, so I, I saw an ad, this was back, students, when you had to get online to find, or you had to, like, look through the newspaper, and I was looking through the newspaper, and there was a, a management position available for honey-baked hams. Boy, they make good hams, don't they? And I thought, this, this, this was me, this, this was, just so you can see, this was 20-year-old Jeff. I like ham. I really like honey baked ham. I would be perfect for that job. So I go, I go and, and I, I take my resume by and it, you know, I, and I sit down and I interview and they're like, well, what kind of people skills do you have? And I said, well, I'm in ministry. And so I deal with all kinds of people every day. I deal with good people and, and bad people, you know, not this church, but other churches. I, I deal with people who are negative and people who are positive. I deal with people who, who like people and people who don't like people. And, and so I, I'm, I'm, I deal with people, and they're like, well, you don't have any managerial experience. I'm like, well, not like you think, but I can manage them. So they gave me the job. They didn't have a clue what they were doing, and I didn't either. And so I, I got in my first day, and I'm sitting in this little cubicle that they called my office. 
And they're saying, all right, we want, you to, we want you to get in there and get after it. Well, I got in there, but I didn't know how to get after it. I'm, I'm present. I was on time because it don't cost anything to be on time. I, you be where you're supposed to be. There. And so I was there, and I was on time. I was actually early, and, and I got in, the, got in my chair, and I didn't have a login to the computer. I didn't know what I was supposed to do when I got on the computer. I didn't know anything. I didn't know Excel. They were like, are you proficient on the computer? And I was like, yeah, I can get on MySpace. You know, that was back when that was real. And uh, the kids are like, what's my space? I, I, what I quickly realized is that I needed to model after someone who was doing the job well. I needed to find someone who knew what they were doing, figure out how they were doing it, and walk in it with them. In, in John chapter 4, Jesus is with the woman at the well. And he begins to speak life to her. You remember the story. Jesus is talking with the woman at the well. And the woman at the well, for all intents and purposes, is not a, a pristine, godly woman. In fact, we know that the, the reason she's there in the middle of the day was that she was a woman of, of ill repute. She was a woman that the other ladies didn't want to be around. So she would come in the middle of the day by herself, um, which is not customary when women would be drawing water from the well. And she would come then so that she didn't have to deal with the rest of the community who saw her as an outcast. But yet that's the person that Jesus goes after because Jesus didn't just look for the most popular or the richest Jesus went to to every heart and every soul and every mind just as our church must do is also so he, he goes in and he he catches this woman and he begins to speak life into her and she says he, she says well the Jews say that we'll worship on this mountain but the Sumerians say that we'll worship on this mountain and Jesus wrecks her theology when he says, the God whom you're looking for, I'm sitting right here before. And Jesus begins to talk to her in ways, begin to tell her her story back to her, and begin to speak even in ways that she left out in her story. And she realized who she was sitting with. So we pick up kind of at the end of their, at the end of their conversation in John 4, 27. John chapter 4, starting, I'm sorry, I'm in Matthew in my Bible. Y'all let me get to John. I was like, that doesn't look right. John 4, 27. And then the disciples came back, and they, they marveled at what he was talking with the woman, but no one said, what do you seek, or what are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar, and she went away into town, and she said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out to the town and they were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know not about. So the disciples said one to another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? He says, Look. I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white with harvest. Already, the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here, the saying holds true, one sows and another reap. I sent you to reap that which you did not labor. Others have labored. And you have entered into their labor. Father, we pray your word would speak true in our heart today. God, we ask you to break down the walls that need broken. We ask you to restore hearts that need restored. We ask you to call those unto salvation who are lost today. We ask you for those who, who are needing to move in areas or, or God respond in areas that you're calling them, that they would have the freedom in that as well today. God, we pray that you would show up and show out. God, we're praying for a God-sized work and a God-sized service. God, we're praying that you would be all that you need to be for us today. God, we're praying that you would do something incredible. Let your glory fall. Let your mercy be experienced today, and we will be careful to praise you. I give you my life, my tongue. I give you everything from the top of my hair to the soles on my shoes. Use it for your kingdom and your glory. And it's in the name of Christ Jesus we pray and believe. And all God's people said, 
Amen. If we're going to reach our city, if we're going to renew our commitment, because this is what we're thinking through, we want to renew our commitment, we, we've got to renew our commitment to go pick the harvest. And in order to do that, we must model, we must model our efforts after Jesus Christ. If we're going to find someone who is a soul winner, we're going to find somebody worthy to follow, then we, we must follow after the one who can actually save lives. I told you last week the most freeing thing I ever experienced in life was realizing that I can't save anyone. I can't save any, unless I've got the little floaty round thing and we're on a boat and you go under and I can throw it to you. Other than that, you're in trouble. Like we've got some great, we've got nurses and we've got all kinds of folks in this room right now. If you hit the deck, they'll jump in and they'll be climbing these chairs and they'll get to you. You don't want me. Like if I'm it for you, we're in trouble. I can call somebody. I can pray. But, but if you need somebody to do mouth to mouth, my friend, I sat through the class, but I don't feel real confident in it. So if, if we're going to model our lives after somebody, we need to model our lives after Jesus Christ. When we look at how Jesus operated, we see that he broke the walls, the cultural walls that were established. He began to tear them down brick by brick. The fact that Jesus is here and he's, he's with this woman at the well, she is not the most prestigious woman. She's not a holy woman. She hasn't walked with the Lord. In fact, she's living with a man. She's cohabitating with a man, been married several times. She's not someone you would look at and go, oh, that's who the Savior of the world is going to, who, that's who he's going to navigate towards. It, it's not, that's not it at all. And yet that's the person that Jesus goes to. In fact, you see by the disciples' reaction that they were surprised by it. Why, why, why is he with her? Does he not know who she is? is does he not know what he's sitting next to does jesus not realize her past does jesus not realize her failures does jesus not realize her incomplete does jesus not realize who he's in the presence of i will tell you that jesus knows exactly who she is and jesus knows exactly who you are you see we can judge this woman but we're no better we've got sin we don't like to admit we've got faults we don't want aired out we think thoughts that are sinful we do actions that are sinful and yet Jesus was still willing to come to the least of these so he could bring forth salvation. Boy, I wish y'all would get excited. We're talking about life. And some of you look like the ushers handed out lemons when you walked in. And so you could be excited in Jesus. It's okay. Look, if y'all saw what I saw, y'all, he took the message to the outcasts. Jesus took the message to the least of these. There was no application process. Jesus was willing, Jesus was willing to go to those of ill repute and those of high moral standard and anyone in between. He didn't ask you for your credit score. When you got saved, he didn't look for your social security number because he already knew it. He didn't ask you how you could manage money. He didn't ask you if you've been divorced. He didn't ask you any of those things. He said, I'll take you just as you are. You can't out God's grace. Yes, I got it. This side wasn't ready. I'm going to say it one more time. You cannot out God's grace. Amen. So no matter where you are today, you are reachable. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, I am reachable. God's grace can reach you today. You haven't gotten far enough out. And for some of you today, that's good news because you've been running a long time. And Jesus went to the outcasts and Jesus went to the sinners. Jesus went to the sinners. In fact, we're often seen, we often get the picture in the text of Jesus going to the people that no one else wanted. He'd go to the lepers. He'd go to the harlots. He would go to the, the highly religious. He would go to the tax collectors. He would go to those who were evil, and he would begin to speak life. When we get so vision-focused on the people have to look like us, they have to talk like us, they have to have the socioeconomic background like we do, we have outcasted the people who need the gospel. The church has to, listen to me, the church has to get beyond the walls of the church if not, we need to take the rest of our property and make golf courses out of it because that's the best we are. If we don't love our city, we're, we're a social gathering. 
You say, but Jeff, how is that possible? Because there's nowhere in the Bible where the people of God get a pass on the great commission of God. Not one place. If we're gathered, it's for the purpose of the glorification of Jesus and to empower to go out and reach our city. How many people did you drive by this morning out at church? There's work to be done. We have not arrived. Jesus was not afraid of who would hear his message. Also, his fulfillment in life was accomplishing the Lord's will. His fulfillment in life. Look at what he says in his text. Look at what he says. They come to him. They say, Rabbi, you're hungry. Rabbi, you've got to eat. Rabbi, it's time. You've got to do something. He said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. I have food to eat that you know nothing about. The disciples just threw them a knuckleball. They're looking around like, what are you talking about? What food do you have? There's no, I, somebody delivered? There's a delivery company? That was one thing we had to get used to when we moved to Pinson. We, we, we weren't used to being in an area in which nobody delivered food. Like sometimes, some of you live in the city and you, people, you know, pizza, Chinese food, something like that. Boy, out here, mm-mm. Where I live, I, if it got that bad, I just had to call my neighbors. Hey, y'all got groceries? Because Domino's ain't coming to your house. Not where we live. They couldn't even find my house. Uh, Papa John's don't even know where I live. Ain't no Chinese food coming that far. You're going to cook it yourself. And the disciples are looking at Jesus going, how does he have food that that we don't know? Did somebody bring him? They're, They're talking amongst themselves. And Jesus says, my food, my food, I'm in verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. You see, he was comforted by the Lord. In fact, his earthly comfort didn't outweigh the calling that God had placed on his life. How many times have you balked at something God called you to because you'd be uncomfortable? How many times have you told the Holy Spirit, no, I can't step there, that I'll I'll be uncomfortable? Well, Holy Spirit, what if what if they don't like me after this? God, what if they don't what God that's God God you're calling me to Guatemala? What? They don't have Wi-Fi there. God, you're calling me to do what? God, that's not comfortable. God, I'm not gonna be comfortable. What if instead of, of seeking earthly comfort, we said we're satisfied in the will of God? What if instead of seeking earthly comfort, we said, Jesus, I'm satisfied in you. Jesus didn't let his, have you ever been hungry? And I'm not, some of you are like, Jeff, I'm hungry right now. I'm not talking about that gap between breakfast and lunch. I, Jesus, had, they'd been walking, they had been traveling, and they find themselves in Samaria. And he's here, and he, he's, he's hungry. And I'm not, like, he doesn't just need, like, this brother needs nutrition. Like, this brother needs some groceries. He's hungry, but he didn't let his growling stomach dictate his actions. He kept fulfilling. He he tells his disciples, he said, It is the will of him who sent me, and it's my desire to accomplish his work. Jesus trusted the Father to be his source of life. He trusted that that God would take those hunger pains away. He trusted that God would supply the power needed to accomplish the will that God had given to him. You see, we must model our efforts after the Lord Jesus, but we must be prepared for the field. We must be prepared for the field. I grew up on a farm. I, I, I know all too well about what picking things feels like. I, I know what it's like to pick corn. I know what it's like to, to gather hay. And In fact, my, my dad used to love to do this. He, he'd say, hey, he'd say, call all you buddies and let's take them down to the farm and go fishing. And the first couple of times he did that, listen, Uncle Wayne, I'd be like, "Woo, going to be a good time at the farm. Got to, got to tackle boxes, got to fishing rods. We're going to go camp out. We're going to catch fish. And, and this is how he, so we'd get there and he wouldn't say a word. He's slick old man now, I'm telling you. Looking back, my dad had a little wisdom that I didn't know about. And, and he would he let us go fishing. And, and we were young, we were teenagers. We'd fish all night long. We'd fish from the time we got there till it was breakfast time the next morning. We'd have fish stacked in. We had a number three wash tub and some of you don't 
don't even know what that is. But we had a number three wash tub, and we'd have catfish just sliding off of it. It'd be so full that catfish just couldn't even put them up there. And we all night long, we'd be fishing. And it, next Saturday morning, we'd done eat breakfast, and we were exhausted. Because we, we'd been up for several, several, several hours by this point. And, and then he'd look at us and say, boys, did y'all enjoy that fishing? Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. All my buddies, yes, sir, yeah. Yeah, Dad, that was a whoo, good time. Going to clean them in just a little bit. But here's what I need you to do, boys. I need you all to go ahead and clean them fish. And when you all get that done, I, I need you to meet me out at the truck. We got to go pick some hay up, and then you all fish this evening too. Well, the first time, I didn't know what that was going to entail. So we, we cleaned the fish, and, and they're like, hey, hey, Jeff, how much hay? I don't know, I don't know. And, and, and then the 18-wheeler pulls up with the trailer. What are we going to do with that? I, I don't know, guys. I, don't, I hadn't seen this before. I've never seen this play. Hey, y'all jump in. So we jumped in the 18-wheeler, and we, we go into a hay pasture. And I'm not talking about this little five-acre pasture. I'm talking it's hay as far as you can see. I'm talking about it, it, it. We weren't in Kansas anymore. It was just hay, just square bales, and they were just stacked up as, as long as every, every couple of feet there was a, a, a bale of hay. And, and so we're trying to figure this out. He says, All right, boys. He goes, When we get all this hay out of this field, y'all can go back to fishing. Dad, Dad, there's four of us. Yeah, y'all got it. Y'all got it. So he was driving the truck, and me and my four buddies who were going fishing are now haying. And I don't know if you've ever picked up hay. But, but, but a square bale of hay is pretty heavy. 5,000 square bales of hay is real heavy. And we were young. You remember being young and dumb? You remember when you could afford that in your life? Young and dumb. But we were all football players. We were all muscled up, every one of us. We were tough. That hay wasn't going. So I, we, we, all, we all stripped, took our shirts off, and we were, we were going to do that and get that knocked out in a couple minutes and get back up there. When we finished as the sun was going down that day, Every one of us was bleeding from under our neck to our waistline. We were so tired. He's like, all right, you're going fishing tonight. We couldn't lift our arms up. I couldn't have hit him if I needed to. I, I, I couldn't. I was ill-prepared for the field. I didn't know. And ever since then, I called my friends up, even today. Hey, y'all run down to farm? No, sir. No, we're busy. Paying taxes this weekend. Ain't got time for farm life. We were ill-prepared for the field but the good news is the field that God's called us to he has given us explicit directions look in your Bible flip over to the the gospel of Matthew in chapter 28 starting in verse 19 Jesus gives the disciples the instructions of how to operate in the field he says I want you to go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. Jesus tells them how we're going to operate in the field. He says, I want you to go out into the field. And I don't just want you to go pick up hay. I want you to go win souls. I've given you the authority. When you look back at 18, it says, I've given you the power. I've given you the authority on heaven and earth. I want you to go and I want you to make disciples. I want you to go tell people about the Lord. I want you to tell people about his resurrection. I want you to tell people about his ascension. I want you to tell them about his life. He gives us the authority. He says, go tell the nations. And when you tell them and they convert, I want you to baptize them. And then I want you to make disciples. I want you to begin to teach them. The church has to teach people what it means to walk in godliness. We have direction. We have power. The question is today, do we have love? You see, quiet lips can be traced back to one of three things. Either we don't believe the story that we're telling. We don't believe it. Or we don't love people. Or we don't care. Either we don't believe the gospel is true. Either we don't believe it's true. Or we don't love people. Or we really just don't care. It has to go back to one of those three. What's keeping your lips quiet when it comes to the things of God? Do you believe that Jesus died and three days later resurrected, sealing the weight of sin, sealing the weight of death, sealing the weight of the grave by his blood? 
Do you love people? You see, we love the great commandment. Love God, love people. But it's a lot more difficult to apply that to everyday life, isn't it? Because we all know people who are hard to love. We know people who are difficult to get along with. We know people that it takes effort to show them the grace of God. Jesus was so about the Father's will that he sat here in John 4. He sat there with a woman that no one else would talk to, and he told her about the goodness of Jesus. He didn't care about her past. He was more concerned with her future. You see, when we pick and choose who we're going to tell people about Jesus, what what we're saying is you're not good enough. What we're saying is we don't love you enough. When we have closed mouths about the gospel, we're testifying that we don't love you. And aren't you glad somebody didn't do that to you? Aren't you glad somebody didn't do that to you? You see, I I had some people that spoke into my life all along the way. I wasn't the smartest. I wasn't the most qualified. But I had a, a group of friends growing up that loved me. They were going to church, and they invited me to go to church too. And I made fun of them the whole way there. I made fun of them. And then they got to sing in their old silly songs. Youth group songs out of, the, out of the early 2000s were rough, guys. They're rough. Tomlin wasn't on the scene yet, guys. It was rough. It was rough. Pharaoh, Pharaoh. You know, anyway. And I remember sitting in youth group that night. I, I, I had never been to church before on, on a Wednesday night. And I didn't know what to do. I was dressed to the tens. On oh, well, Wednesday, and everybody else was in gym shorts and T-shirts. I was dressed in, in khakis and a button-up shirt with a sweater over it. I looked good. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. But I was ill-dressed for the moment because I didn't know about the culture. I didn't know what to expect. And the youth pastor came riding into youth group that night. He was uh, in his mid-30s at the time, and he came riding in on a big wheel because that's what youth pastors do. And I remember looking at him going, what is this goofball? And, how, and I'm supposed to listen to him. And he told me about Jesus, and he told me about how good God's grace is. And I walked out of there that night, and I got back in the car with my buddies, and they said, hey, you going to come next week? And I was like, that was so dumb. Yeah, pick me up before you go. Made fun of them all week long. Made fun of everything they did, and yet I was drawn to it. I couldn't explain why, and and for weeks that would go on. I'd I'd make fun of it. Hey, that song y'all sang was so goofy. Everybody was dancing around like a bunch of idiots. You coming next week? Yeah, I'll be here. I couldn't figure out why I was, I was being sucked in, but it was something about when the people of God begin to love you and something about being drawn into a group of people who care more about your future than they care about your past was contagious to me. They began to show me the love of Christ in ways that I had never understood. They began to care about me in tangible ways. All of a sudden, they started calling me, and I that my friend group began to change because I began to implement some of them into my life. And I remember just that weird feeling. Some of my really earthly friends that that we'd go get tore up with on Friday night, they're like, what are you doing going to church? I was like, I don't know, a bunch of weirdos, but man, I like them. They're different, but man, I like them. And so my friend group started coming with me and, and our lives began to change drastically for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on March the 24th, I was sitting in a service and the preacher had just preached out of John, and I could still take you to the passage at which he preached. It impacted my life. We were, we were in a small sanctuary, and we had, we had pews. We didn't have chairs like we have in here. And I remember during the invitation, we were singing, Come Just As You Are. And I was sitting about four rows back, and I remember the Holy Spirit, the weight of, of God being pressed upon me as he was calling me unto salvation. My heart was beating through my chest. I could feel the pulse in my fingertips. I clenched that handrail on that, on that pew so tightly that my, my knuckles were turning white. I was weeping and I didn't know why. I was crying at the bigness of God and at the, just the depravity of my soul. And it was one of those songs when you're in church and, and the music minister won't stop singing. And the pastor just, we were in the 11th stanza of Come Just As You Are. People had done left and went and got lunch and came back and we were still singing. It would not stop it. It would not stop it. And so the, the pastor gives you the whole, everybody close your eyes and bow your head part. And I thought, thank God it's over. 
God, thank you, it's over. And he said, we're going to go one more time. He said, somebody needs to get saved in this room. God's telling me that right now. And at that point, I said, God, you're talking straight to me. And I pushed people out of the way, part of the Red Sea. And I walked down, and my life has never been the same since. I said, Jesus, you are Lord of my life from this point forward. Everything I am belongs to you, and all my life will be yours. I didn't know what that meant when I prayed it, or I wouldn't have prayed it then. Um, but I, looking back, but the love of God through the love of people transformed my life. I was a nobody from Corner, Alabama. I was a nobody that a church began to think was somebody, and God called me by name and brought me into the family. Had they not loved me? Had my first interaction at that church gone horribly wrong? Had I not experienced that warmness that came from them? I am confident I would have never went back. I would have never went back. But the love that that church displayed that day set in motion my life in ways that I could have never guessed. My question for us is today is, do, do we love? Do we love people enough to share the gospel with them? Do we love our community enough to try to reach them for the goodness of God? Do we care about Jesus? Jesus continues. So the woman gets so excited about Jesus that she leaves her pie and she leaves. And, and so then we catch the conversation that the disciples have. And Jesus begins to speak to them and he tells them, he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He says, do you not say there are four months yet until the harvest? But he says, lift up your eyes. The problem with our church is we're walking around with our eyes lowered. Lift up your eyes eyes and see that the fields are ready. See that the fields are ready. See that they're white with harvest. It, we're ready to reap what God has sown. You see, we're going to get there when we start caring about eternity. We'll see people as God sees them when we catch an eternal heart. We'll see people when we have an eternal mind. We must care about eternity. Our city needs a church that's kingdom focused. Our city needs a church that's kingdom focused. We must be kingdom focused. We must be kingdom focused Christians. Our city needs kingdom workers. Our city needs kingdom workers. He needs people that, that are willing to go knock on doors, willing to go stand in the public, willing to live a life that, that, is, that is publicly professing Christ. Our city needs to see us loving one another. Our city needs to see us building each other up. Our cities need to see us caring about people, stepping in when no one else is stepping in. Our city needs to see us first on the front lines for community. Our city needs to see us first when it comes to giving to the needy. Our city needs to see us first when it comes to sharing the gospel. Listen, you want to be radical. Nobody else is doing this. Nobody else is doing this. There's no other church reaching our city. We're being left lost. Your church needs you to, your city needs to, for you to act like the church. Your city needs you to act like the church. Your city needs kingdom partners. Your city needs a church willing to stand in the gap for the people here. Is that taking them food? Is that partnering with our school? What would it look like if the high school at Pinson had such an evangelical presence that revival broke out? My goodness. Parents, what would you, how would you feel if you had to send your kids to school and you knew when they got there they were going to be prayed for? You knew when they walked in the door, they were, they were people caring, and the church had a presence. That's obtainable. That's obtainable. But do we love enough to go do it? See, today we need to renew our commitment to go pick the harvest. That means for some of you, as my grandmother would say, it's time to get it in gear. It's time to get it in gear. These chairs are comfortable, but if this is the existence of your faith, then you don't have faith. You have comfort. I'm not the most entertaining guy in the world. I, you, you see that. But I want to be a pastor that preaches the gospel. You see, the reason we preach the gospel is because it's the only thing that can save people. I can't save you. Our deacons can't save you. Our leadership team, they can't save you. But God can. 
Our, the hope for Pinson is the people of God working in the power of God to accomplish the will of God. That's the only way we make this thing happen. Today we renew our commitment to go pick the harvest. There are so many people who are waiting to hear the gospel. They're waiting to hear truth. They're waiting to hear about how God restores lives. They're waiting to hear about how God restores families. They're waiting to hear about how God can take what is broken and make it whole. They're waiting to hear about how God can, can take that which culture says it, it's, it's waste, it's garbage, it's trash, and he can make it new. See, the city's waiting on the church to mobilize for the message of the cross. I get in more conversations now than I ever have of people who know nothing about Jesus. No, nothing. We used to live in a day in the South where it was afforded that most people had heard an accurate picture of Jesus, but that day is long gone. Your city needs you to tell the old, old story of how a Savior came from glory. Are you willing to stand in the gap for your city? Say, Jeff, I don't know how. We'll teach you. Jeff, I don't have, Jeff, Jeff, I don't have the power. No, you don't. Can we, can we say that today? No, you don't have the power. But Jesus said, when you got the Spirit of God living in you, Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given over. All authority. Jesus said, all authority. All authority on heaven and earth has been given unto you. Go make disciples. Let every one of them, everybody you see, should know that they've been in the presence of God. Everybody you see should know that they've been in the presence of God. Follow me to the end of our passage. This is, look at your neighbor and say, we're finishing, but it's getting good. Thank you. Jesus tells them in verse 38, he says, I sent you to reap that which you did not labor. Jesus said, I sent you to reap that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Jesus said, I'm sending you to places, and you're going to walk in, and, and you're, going to, you're going to say the name of Jesus, and they're going to want to get saved. He said, others have, have prepared the road before you. Others have stood in the gap for you, and now that you're here, you're going to get to hit the home run, and you're going to see repentance. He said, but I have sent you to reap where you did not labor. Others have labored, and they have entered into their labor. Now listen, what, what Jesus is saying there are people before you. There are people before you who have laid the foundation for you and I to get serious about making disciples, for you and I to get serious about making much of Jesus. He says, we need to enter into their story. We need to continue where they have left off. We have to keep going further. We have to keep sharing more because the story has already begun and we're part of the finish. I don't know if we're the closing chapter or not. But I'd sure hate to leave this world undone. I'd sure hate to leave this world undone. Why don't today you enter into somebody else's story? Why don't today you enter into someone else's story? God has prepared hearts, open and ready to hear the gospel. Right now, there are people in our city, God has prepared their hearts to hear the gospel. What if nobody tells it to them? What if nobody tells it to them? We must live like Jesus is coming back tomorrow. We must live like, if you knew Jesus was coming back at 8.30 in the morning, what kind of conversations would you have tonight? Who would you call and make sure they were right before the Lord? Who would you share with? Why don't we live with urgency? Live with compassion. And why don't we re renew our commitment to pick the harvest? Father, I trust you today. Lord, I ask you during this invitation time, Lord, that you begin to speak life into hearts. Father, we know people right now, if time ended, they would be in trouble. God, we know people right now who are desperate to hear the good news that Jesus saves. God, I pray you'd burden our hearts so much. God, I pray you would make us miserable until we were obedient. Father, I pray that the city of Pinson would begin to feel that there's a new spirit rising, that there's a new heart being brought in. God, I pray our city feels the prayers of saints as we begin to pray to see lives transformed by the gospel of Jesus. Lord, we know this happens. 
when the people of God surrender to your will. So God, I, I pray during this invitation, Lord, we can't share what we don't have, and there's people sitting in this audium, auditorium today who have never experienced a saving relationship with you. They can't share what they don't have. So Lord, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation, that they would understand that you're a God who went as far as you would go. You, you went all the way to a cross to die as a remission of our sin. You were buried. And three days later, you arose victorious. The chains of sin, the chains of death, and the chains of hell were ripped off of us when you ascended. When you came out of that grave, there was no more sting of those things. When you came back from the dead, the curse was gone. I pray our city hears that good news, that they could be alive in Christ. God, for those you're calling to minister today, I pray they would receive that. For those you're calling to partner with our church, I pray they'd receive that today. For those you're stirring in their heart and their affection to be more like Christ, I pray they would take those steps of obedience. But we're here to proclaim in one voice, with one heart, that we believe you're ready to win your city for Jesus. Use us to do that. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. If God's called you today, maybe God's called you to salvation, we, I, want to, I want to talk to you about that. We've got people who would love to pray over you about that. If you want to partner with our church by membership, you want to partner with us by serving, we want to give you an opportunity in this invitation to respond. You want to come down, make, make the front of this thing an altar and have time with the Lord. Maybe you've got to repent for silent lips. Maybe you realize today that my heart don't love people like, like God's called me to love. Whatever you need to do during this invitation, you're free and you're welcome. It's, it's your time to respond to the holiness of God. Will you stand and sing with us?